You wouldn't normally invite your friends over to admire your home heating system, but the Vermont Castings wood stove deserves center stage. I think it's the best of both worlds because you get a piece of something in your house that's gorgeous to look at, but it's also highly functional. It's a fact it can back up against a nice warm heat source in the middle of the winter. It just feels, feels warm. The Vermont's Castings Wood Stove is a favorite for energy conscious consumers. Traditionally, wood stoves have had a bad rap when it comes to clean, efficient burning. In the early days, uh, wood stoves were just cast iron boxes with a grate and you put wood into it and you burnt it and, and whatever went up the chimney went up the chimney and whatever heat came out, came out. But that's all changed. The Encore 2-in-1 stove uses two types of combustion for clean burning. A cartridge placed in the back chamber acts as a combustion catalyst. The smoke is actually captured and reburned. Hardly any escapes into the atmosphere. You burn the wood to make the smoke, and then the smoke reburns to make additional heat. The Vermont Castings Company was founded 40 years ago by a man with cold feet. Duncan Syme was an architect who chose to escape the Big Apple and move to rural New England. You come to Vermont with the idea that you are getting back to the land and, and people cut their own wood, I mean, grow their own food. I mean, it's, this is just a lifestyle uh, that attracts people to Vermont. One night, when Syme hadn't stoked his old coal burner, he woke up to a shocking sub-zero chill. It was that teeth-chattering moment that inspired him to build a better stove. He ended up talking his brother-in-law into helping him set up a foundry in Bethel, Vermont. All the rumors on the street were there was a couple of hippies down underneath the bridge there building stoves, but nobody knew how, you know, how well it was going to go. And then, you know, lo and behold, you know, it transformed the town, essentially. He built his first stove, which he named the Defiant. And as it turned out, designing a wood-burning stove to heat homes in the early 70s was great timing. Uh, early 70s, when it was the oil embargo uh, kicked in and oil prices spiked, um, and sales just took off. And on a Saturday morning, the traffic would be backed up to the railroad station with people with pickups and trailers coming to pick up their stoves. The Vermont Casting Stove is still produced here in the foundry where it all began. It's hard to imagine that something so beautiful starts out as someone else's waste. It's old automotive, it's radiators, machine cast. I mean, you even got kitchen sinks in there for that matter, you know. So we're turning that stuff that nobody wants anymore, melting it down and pouring it into fresh appliances. An electromagnet picks up the old scrap and runs it through a gas-fired preheater until it's red hot. We preheat that metal to about 1,000 degrees, and then we uh, transport that into a charged bucket that's then situated over the uh, electric furnaces, and uh, the material is charged into a molten metal bath. In here, the metal is heated to 2,700 degrees, then transferred to a small pouring furnace. From there, a 4,000-pound ladle is filled and transported to the pouring line. This is one spoon you make way for. For centuries, foundries have used fine sand with a good clay content to make the molds for cast iron. The sand is what really gives us the finish on the casting. The sand is selected purposely for that reason. It picks up the detail of the design. It's a very critical piece uh, of the process. 100 tons of sand cycle through the plant every hour, making a continuous line of molds in this machine. It makes uh, about 400 pound sand molds in about 12 seconds, so it can run a little over 300 molds an hour. A squirt of compressed air cleans each mold before it's refilled. Those molds are transported down a walking beam conveyor, and uh, the metal is poured into those sand molds. Once filled, the molds need to be cooled slowly so the molecules in the metal can align to the maximum strength. In the shakeout area, the molds are then separated from their castings. It's shaking out those castings. It's, uh, it's oscillating conveyors that move that sand and actually start that sand breaking down. That sand will return to the mixer and go back through the molding machine so it's all recycled. The cast parts are loaded onto wire pallets and passed through a shot blasting machine to clean them up. There are eight 25 horsepower wheels that throw uh, steel shot 
at the castings. Uh, 3,600 RPM these things are spinning at, so there's a lot of velocity, a lot of force. This impact will knock and clean the sand off the casting and put a nice finish on the parts. The parts go through another cooling cycle on their way to the grinding line, where any seams from the molding process are ground smooth. Then we'll, we'll go into the drilling area where we'll actually drill and tap uh, fastening holes so that by the end of the run, uh, we've got those castings in a basket ready to go for assembly. Parts that need enameling get sprayed with a ground coat and then a cover coat. High density porcelain balls are used to grind the enamel to a fine, sprayable slurry. The cover coat goes on and the freshly enameled parts pass turtle slow through a 700 foot oven. And we go at about four inches a minute for the glass to melt into, uh, into shape. In another part of the plant, they make something called the refractory. It's a ceramic liner, and the reason why your iron stove doesn't burn cherry red when it's cranked up. It's made of fused silica that can withstand temperatures of up to 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit. We pour it into rubber molds, and, and we let it air dry for 24 hours, and then we bake that particular mold at about uh, six to 800 degrees for uh, six hours. The refractory is crucial to clean combustion. It actually uh, helps the reburning of the gases, and uh, the fused silica is actually the same material that we line our furnaces with at the foundry, so it can take extreme heat. At this point, the cast and enameled parts arrive at assembly. First, the primary air valves go on. They're how air gets into the stove. They apply an adhesive gasketing to all the connecting parts to ensure the stove is airtight. The back and side panels go on, and then the parts that make up the refractory are slotted in. The front panel gets assembled last and is malleted into place. Well, we do a, a visual inspection on the stove to make sure all the, the fits and finishes are correct, uh, the line of the stove is that the doors close correctly. Before they get packed, each stove undergoes a simulated smoke test to ensure that it's airtight. Uh, and then as a final thing, we actually fill the unit with smoke and draw a vacuum and see if the uh, any smoke uh, pulls out through the gasketed area so we'll know whether it leaks or not. Soon these stoves will be on their way to people around the world who can't resist the allure of a wood stove, the snap and crackle of burning wood, the smell of smoke, not to mention endless hours of fire-gazing enjoyment.